Hello, my name is Fraser Simons. This is my channel, Springboard Thought. Today I'm doing a recent reads with, uh, I don't know, usually between four to six books, depending on how I feel the time is playing out. I don't usually try to run past 20 minutes, but it happens. We'll see. The first book I want to talk about is Siren Queen by Nevo, and this is a three-star read for me. It's an issue with soft world building, I think predominantly with this book. So this is about a Asian woman who is trying to make it in Hollywood and kind of the, I don't know, perception of how we perceive some of the people that run Hollywood and its sort of inner machinations in the golden age of filmmaking are literalized to a fable-like context. So, for instance, a sort of like Harvey Goldstein type person who is really predominant and decides who's in what uh, films and uh, takes like a pound of flesh and is the bad guy, basically. Um, he is like a wolf creature who, so like beyond human, and this is normalized within the setting. So I guess it would be somewhat like magical realism. Um, but there's just a bunch of different creatures that exist that more or less um, equate to how they are perceived or enshrined on the golden uh, screen. And what's more is the stars in the sky um, correspond to stars in Hollywood creating films and stuff. Um, and so because it's soft world building, meaning that the world is not very codified and that these details that I'm mentioning are almost like offhand remarks or bits of world building that are done, um, almost extra, but uh, like, like, I don't know, they feel, they feel very side matter. And I think that is a technique that can be deployed when people know sort of what you're trying to equate um, both sides to. So for instance, in Harry Potter, there's soft world building because people are very much aware of that kind of um, folklore as well as British culture. However, maybe it's just me, but I'm not that familiar with uh, Hollywood in the golden times of filmmaking, nor am I very familiar with the uh, mythological things that are being drawn on, or if it's just a literalization of how we perceive uh, very quintessential uh, films in that time period that I'm just not aware of. Um, that could be a possibility as well. It, it very much could be really famous works of Hollywood that have been, I don't know, canonized or gone through in the public consciousness are the things being extrapolated into this sort of literal mythologizing of their uh, personhood to creaturehood to stardom type stuff. I'm not sure, but it was all pretty confusing to me, <laughs> as you might be able to tell. Um, and so I liked the sort of rags to riches and her having to pay, um, but also trying to navigate as a queer woman uh, in this very, like, simultaneously cruel um, and esoteric, almost like subcultures uh, emerging uh, area in which she can try to navigate to safe spaces, but is very much made like a, a Faustian bargain in which she's never really going to find the true thing that she wants at the cost of you know, this very adolescent dream of becoming a star. And that's a story that everybody is familiar with, with people, uh, especially young women who go to become stars and get in over their heads and try to navigate and out fox, literal foxes in this case. So it was interesting, but there wasn't so much there there. And I would have liked a much harder a uh, set of world building being divulged to me so I knew exactly how this world functioned because there's felt like a lot of sort of deus ex machina stuff happening where 
there would just be these fantastical things that would occur to either introduce or uh, wrap up obstacles. And while they were interesting, I didn't understand why they were really happening other than to have like a cool plot unfold, I guess. But yeah, so that's what I thought about that. Next I read with Sandy from Miss Reads A Lot, A Suitable Boy uh, by Bikram Seth. This was fantastic. I think we read it in 10 days, something like that. Um, and I ended up having to order another copy because I spilled tea on it. But Book Outlet thankfully had another copy of it. And then that copy arrived and it's got a dent in the corner. So now I've got two imperfect copies of it. Even though this isn't really bad for a tea stain. It is the only time I've ever spilt on a book before ever. And it's one of my favorite novels of all time now. <sighs> so this book is about <sighs> so many things. But... At the heart of it, it is about a pivotal decision. Uh, Lata is having to, uh, in a sort of Pride and Prejudice way, uh, she is needing to be set up with a good family. And it's very helpful, I think, to think of her family and families like this as sort of landed gentry, Jane Austen type situation where they're trying to make good match pairs for people, um, probably there's a lot more thought, I think, put into the actual matches than Jane Austen stuff where <laughs> there's more of a vibe and if they're making enough money and, and stuff like that. This is much more down to like who they are as fundamental people, what they like, um, and even astrological symbols and charts and stuff like that. But anyway, she has reached an age where she uh, needs to be found a suitable boy and there are a number of uh, people that are or may not be suitable. She is one of the main protagonists. There's another one named Mon, M-A-N, uh, M-A-A-N. I think it's Mon then, right? Um, and we are unsure how he fits into this story at the beginning. He's sort of like the bad boy. He's uh, very rich. He falls in love with this uh, courtesan. And he's he's not supposed to do that. Uh, he's just the most unsuitable boy. And we're wondering if his story converges with Lotus. That is, uh, she's basically the opposite. She's very smart. She's in college uh, or university, I should say. She's very learned. She knows herself fairly well. But she's also very young because I think she's 19. She has no... Uh, interactions with love. She has only applied herself to studies and to her um, family's wishes and stuff like that. And so what follows is a unfurling. Um, if you think of the core of this story as maybe a flower, each of the unfolding petals around it kind of enunciate why and the much wider context of what is happening with her needing to choose a suitable boy because initially it's kind of a superfluous or mundane or just like seemingly a very small cultural specific uh, decision that needs to be made but actually it becomes indicative of the entire um, partitions history in India where we learn all the different nuances of what a suitable boy may or may not be, as well as the uh, socio-economic political caste system that is being fed into this. Uh, so what becomes such a small decision, seemingly, becomes about literally everything. Uh, and so it becomes a history of India in part. It becomes a wider, larger, uh, all-encompassing picture. Well, maybe not all-encompassing, but it does its best basically to give you so much context and nuance into the cultural situation that you feel almost as Lada's mother feels in attempting to set up the life of uh, her daughter and the continuation of a sort of dynastic family. Uh, the pressures of the the social, um, in some ways justice, but also the 
the progressive growth of an adolescent country parallels Lata's uh, making her first adult decision, which the country is about to do as well. There's a lot of characters, um, but I think the book does a really great job of introducing you to them and showing you why they are pertinent, again, to the core story of what is happening. Um, it is a masterpiece of plotting. The prose work is exceptional. It is highly readable. It, it goes very fast despite being huge. It is completely, utterly pleasant to consume, I think. I wish the audiobook was available, but in Canada, it's, it's you can't get it anywhere, no matter how, whatever site that you want to get an audiobook from, you won't be able to get it here. <laughs> um, and I think Sandy had a similar situation in the US. In Australia, in the UK, you can get it. So I hate you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but reading it all on the page was completely fantastic regardless. Uh, I don't regret reading it whatsoever and I'm sure that I'll reread it in the future. Uh, an all-time favorite book. Next is The Town by Chuck Hogan, which was a very interesting book because it's one of my favorite heist movies. This uh, centers on Charlestown in Boston, which is um, ostensibly, I haven't checked this out for myself, uh, got a neighborhood, Charlestown, where the people are uh, known for robbing banks, basically. <laughs> um, there's, at least in one point in history, I'm not sure if it's true still, probably not, um, per capita, it was like the largest amount of bank robbers and, and bank robberies happening or something like that. And we follow the lives of a core team who are doing those. Uh, at the very beginning, they're pulling off a heist and they uh, have to, well, one of them feels that they have to take a hostage. So they take a bank manager uh, as collateral in case the police find them. The police don't find them and they eventually release the woman. But because she's spent some time with them in the vehicle, they feel like um, maybe she's still like a security risk. And so one of them, the main character, uh, goes to um, spy on her and, and double check that she's basically like not giving them away or anything like that. But what follows is sort of an unlikely pseudo romance that occurs in which he falls for the girl but doesn't really know why he's doing it. And that's kind of the heart of the story. Um, in between the drama of that situation, there are also bank robberies that occur. Uh, there is a lot of characterization for the core group uh, of friends. Basically, um, the main character and his brother are the, I don't know, dynamic duo of the 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 story and have the most screen time, as well as that brother's sister being a former love interest of the main guy who has now gone to AA, he's been cleaned up, and he is essentially looking for a way out. Um, and he doesn't realize it, but he is substituting his obsession um, and his vice for the woman. Uh, who is represents getting out of this cyclical thing that has killed their parents or incarcerated them anyway and uh, he sees where everything is going because he's the only one that's sort of clean um, and meanwhile the people that he is working with and loves like the brother um, and knows like the former relationship, the sister, uh, is trying like quicksand to keep him in Charlestown and make his pattern repeat like everybody else, including his father, who's in prison. Um, it sounds like kind of a weird and wild ride, but the movie, I think, is less convincing of why their relationship develops um, between the main character and the bank manager, as this book spends a lot of time trying to contextualize and show um, how and what she means to him in a very like almost dehumanized way. Like it's a desperate 
bid an attempt for him to uh, change himself predicated on another person, which is then an analogy for what many couples um, go through in their lives, basically. Um, so it's kind of like a critique of that, but also parallels the wider context of his career, I guess, as a bank manager, or as a bank robber, not a manager. <laughs> um, and what basically the foreshadowing for what may or may not occur in the end when they take on like one last job. Um, it is extremely intelligent very well researched with a lot of um, interesting facts about bank robberies. There's lots of technical details about how they're going about the heist. The choreography is immaculate. It is almost a literary uh, novel except for the fact that um, the other characters, I would say, beyond his best friend and that sister relationship, being very two-dimensional um, and not very I don't know, fleshed out compared to the core members. And so there are aspects of it that feel cardboardy and commercial fiction, whereas some of the stuff, particularly to do with the protagonist, is absolutely literary and first class. Um, it was a five-star novel for me. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I just watched the film yesterday or the day before, uh, and it was really interesting to see the difference in the Hollywoodization of this book. Um, I think it's not given nearly as much due credit as uh, it deserves, and it's a very unusual heist, um, robbery type fiction, crime fiction thing. Um, I definitely recommend it, loved it. And next is a book that I've done a single review of already, After Sappho by Shelby Wynn Schwartz. This is a uh, paralleling the fragments of Sappho, a fragmented um, work that has a mystery at the heart where you're trying to discern why it's fragmentary, who it's tracing, because it's very like uh, omnipotent and shifting and refers to a group of people mostly in like Paris, um, if I remember correctly, for a majority of it anyway to people in Paris and it speaks in a collective we chorus. So you're, so you're thinking is these, is this predominantly all the lesbians? Because then why is it only people in Paris, right? That doesn't make sense. And is it, is it only like a specific group, like a, a, a collective or something? Um, because it's using nonfiction peppered in with, I think, gratuitous amounts of fiction. Uh, for vignettes of a certain amount of characters, all of whom are queer, and all of whom are basically retracing the history of queer women and the uh, oppression of women in Italy, um, as well as across Europe in later stages, but in the beginning it's mostly concerned with Italy, uh, and showing the ways in which they have thrived despite that oppression and slowly unravel the threads of like being put down and um, the evolution of their voice and the fiction of which this is a continuation of. Uh, there's the reveal, I guess, worked for me. I really liked that it was experimental or unconventional. And whenever a book is attempting something and has like that kind of mystery component where you're trying to figure it out, I generally will like it. And so this was like a three and a half rounded up to four stars for me. Uh, I liked the reveal. I'm not sure that it fully actually accomplishes what it wants to. And it's so intersectional in what it's uh, attempting to be that it doesn't know actually what it is. Like she literally says that in the afterward. <laughs> she doesn't know how to classify it or what it is. Um, she's just attempting to do a very specific thing, um, which is a springboard off of another uh, queer, uh, very celebrated author um, and an idea that they had. I think it was interesting, but you should go in with tempered expectations probably. I haven't seen anybody rave about this completely, which should give you pause, <laughs> but it it's also a book that is so new that there was no 
expectations aligning the reader. So maybe now that you kind of know what it's about and you go in with that, maybe you will be able to rave about it. I also would not recommend this specific edition. I would recommend the US one because the um, binding is wildly tight and only gets worse. It's so tight that it hurt my thumbs to spread it apart in order to read it at some points. Uh, and the margins or the gutter in the center is really bad um, at points. So go with a different edition. And then lastly, I want to do a quick review of Treacle Walker, another one that I've done a single review of as well that you can check out. I love this. I give this five out of five stars. Um, I feel it's very much a reaction to modern fantasy. It's steeped in colloquial uh, UK regional texts that I'm not aware of, but I still think it works. You have to really be on, I guess, engaged as a reader and pay attention to what is happening. But um, it's very surrealistic, metaphysical, and is giving you the pieces of a puzzle to assemble uh, the story, even as it's like unfurling in a very unconventional, haphazard, confusing kind of way because of the surrealistic aspects to it. But if you read it um, in earnest, it tells you exactly what the meaning behind all of the different symbols and objects mean and what they actually are doing. And so it does make its own kind of sense. It constructs its own sense out of different meanings and the recontextualization of those things, which is its fun, its playfulness. It's very well written. Uh, it has an exceptional rhythm. The diction is phenomenal. It is an excellent book um, or novella, I think, more like than um, a novel. It was, it's a book that I think would be uh, very beneficial to reread and I plan to do so. And uh, I guess it takes place in the 1950s, even though it felt like it f was unmoored in time, except that it felt fairly archaic probably because of the diction used and because of the um, folkloric elements. But um, someone was saying the comic that makes um, an appearance in this dates it to the 1950s or something. However, because it's surrealistic and I think it takes place in this person's mind to so much degree that it, it doesn't really matter when it is because you're going to have to re-jigger in your mind what each thing that he's interacting with actually means for the story. The chimney is not just a chimney, the mirror is not just a mirror, the chalk is not just chalk. Um, things have ulterior motives and do different uh, things than you are expecting, like the chalk and the mirror and the chimney and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's just a fantastic bit of reading and a good snipe on modern fantasy, which is workmanlike trash at the moment. That's the uh, week of reading for me. Feel free to comment whatever you like down below and I will engage with you and I will see you next video. Bye.